Hey guys, I'm going to be reading your homework to you, which is pages 42 through 62. March 19th, Monday. Played at nights with Mark, Oliver, and Humphrey today. As Mark is bigger than me, he was the horse and I rode his back. We won. Oliver toppled from his horse and got a bloody nose. Serves him right, for he did twist my ears most painfully and called me the worst names when I first wore my new shirt. March 30th, Tuesday. Wrote yesterday night by candles flicker and fell asleep with quill in hand. When I awoke, the candle had set the pages alight and would have burned my straw mattress or worse if Humphrey had not smelled smoke and beat out the flames. This morning, Chaplin likewise beat my backside to teach me care with candles, he said. Ate saltfish again today. Disgusting. Here they are more careful to follow the church's rules than at home. So besides every Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday being fish days, they also eat fish on each church festival. This means we eat vile fish more often than flesh or fowl. April 11th, Wednesday. Watched my uncle practice for the joust today. He charged 11 times at a wooden ring hung from a tree and caught it on his lance five times. It takes so much skill to lift the ring from its hook while galloping at full speed. And all who saw this agree it bodes well for the contest. April 22nd, the Lord's Day. Tomorrow begin the joust. The, ho the host of noble knights who accepted my uncle's challenge are lodged at inns nearby and are encamped upon the fields outside the castle. Two score gaily colored tents sprouted in the night like mushrooms. Flying from lances planted in the ground, the knights pennants look like flowers in a spring meadow. All the talk is of who shall prevail, and methinks the men of the castle guard place waiters on the winner. I pray my uncle shall vanquish them all. April 23rd, Monday. This being the feast day of St. George, the whole castle was astir well before sunrise in preparation for the joust. All the clashes were keenly fought, but I shall give account of my uncle's combat first. His opponent was Lord Sudbury. Everyone from the castle and the village folk besides gathered eagerly to watch their charge. After some ceremony of which I shall tell later, the two knights trotted to opposite ends of the list, which is what they call the strip of field where the combat takes place. When they were some 300 paces apart, they turned to face each other. The sunlight danced on their shiny helms and on the bright colors of their families, arms, blazed on their shields and armor. On the command, Lazy as Aller, from a herald, both knights urged their horses forward. Prickled with sharp spurs, the snorting horses galloped faster and faster until they ran as swift as a march gale. Each knight aimed his lance at the shield of the other, and the watchers cried, Huzzah! When my uncle stayed on his horse and knocked Sudbury to the ground, three times my uncle toppled Sudbury. Here's an image of what a joust would look like. You have all your crowds here, and then here in the middle in front of everybody is where the joust takes place. At their third meeting, though, the force of Sudbury's blow lifted my uncle, too, clean from his saddle. Those who watched gasped, alas, in fear for my uncle's laugh. But he quickly rose to his feet and raised his iron glove to steal the hubbub. Then, though, he found that he could not raise the visor on his helm, so twisted it from the fall. And when later the herald announced that my uncle was the victor, he was nowhere to be found. At length, a search of the castle discovered my uncle in the armory, with his head laid on an anvil and the smith at work upon his helm. Tis surely a wonder the smith could remove it without harming a hair on my uncle's head. April 25th, Wednesday. There seems each day of the joust to be less sport than the day before, and more boring ceremony. Before combat begins each morn, the knight withdraw to their arming tents, where a squire helps him dress for the joust. When they return, fully armed, there is much bowing low and making of speeches. When these dull preparations are complete, the heralds proclaim the names of the combatants, whose faces are hidden beneath their shiny helms. Only then did the first two knights face each other and spur their horses on. And to my mind, the excitement that follows is over far too soon. April 26th, 
April 26, Thursday. The jousting ends at last. I swear I should die of boredom if I were to listen to just one more speech. And after so many charges, all nights looked the same. If I had known it would be thus, I should have feigned illness on Monday and so escaped the ordeal. The new hose that I wear for this grand event is hot, for it clings to my legs as tightly as the skin clings to a sausage, and it is my duty to wait upon my aunt all day while she watches, which tires me much. Gilbert, Earl of Hertford, was this day mortally wounded in the jousts, but when I talked of it with Mark, he only said, well, tis common. May 3rd, Thursday. Today was an Egypti day, and as all know, ill fortune follows any work that starts on these two unlucky days in the month. Our chaplain cautioned us that twas but a superstition from heathen Egypt. My uncle also told us we should not mind it. Later, though, I heard him tell a groom to put away the horses he had saddled, for only fools start journeys on Egypti days. May 14th, Monday. While we studied this forenoon, my cousin Abigail scratched a message in her wax tablet and passed it to me. Chaplain seized it, and now I must rise before dawn for a week and pray with him. This seems to me most unjust. I am punished, though I did no wrong. She did wrong, yet is not punished. May 27th, the Lord's Day. Yesterday was one of the great celebration. For my uncle dubbed Simon a knight. Now he is 21. Simon has been full seven years a squire and has learned well the noble skills of knighthood. Two days did Simon spend in prayer and fasting. On Friday night, he slept not at all, but kept vigil in the chapel, praying until dawn. Then, at cock crow, he bathed and dressed in a tunic of pure white and attended mass. Only after this could he break his fast and venture out into the bailey for the armoring ceremony. First, my uncle dressed him in a coat of mail. Then Simon put on a gleaming helm and gilded spurs and grasped a shield painted with two burgess ravens. When this was done, he knelt to await the collie, the blow from my uncle's sword that would make him a knight. I thought this would be no more than a light tap and was alarmed to see how heavy was the blow, but Simon was expecting it thus. He rose speedily and swore a solemn vow to be a gallant and brave knight, then all cheered as he mounted a fine Spanish palfrey and rode round the bailey. Later, there was feasting in the hall in Simon's honor. He will make a fine knight, and he is a good and kind cousin. June 9th, Saturday. The weather of late has been fearsome hot. We have not seen a cloud in weeks, and the ground is parched from want of rain. The river has sunk lower than any can remember, and green slime grows in that part of the moat where we usually swim. In the bailey, two men dig a new well. This is oft a wet and muddy task, but as there is little water to fill the well, the men can work dry foot. June 13th, Wednesday. The garter robes all reek. When I have need of them, I rush in nimbly, clutching my nose. I let fall my hose and pray that relief will be quick. This forenoon, when I sat upon the wooden seat, out from under it flew a black fly so fat that at first I took it to be a wren. June 15th, Friday. This day, the gong farmer came from the village to work below the south wall. On this side of the castle, the garter robes empty down chutes in the moat. But because there has been no rain, the moat is sluggish in its flow, and everything that falls from the chutes stays where it drops. The gong farmer must clear not only these piles, but others besides. For elsewhere in the castle, the garter robes empty into pits, which must, which must be cleaned to keep them sweet. One of the garter robe chutes is blocked, and the gong farmer must reach up inside the slimy pipe to unclog it. I would not do his job for all the king's gold. A humming black cloud hangs always above a gong farmer's head. Nose warns of his approach long before I espy him, and all ears are alert to the squeaking of his stinking cart. Okay, so take notice of the picture over here to the side. You can kind of see what a gong farmer is and what the garter robe shoots are. So this is their bathroom. You can see him sitting up here on what we would call a toilet these days. And then on the, the, the chute, the garter rope chutes, it falls down and comes out here to where the gong farmer is doing his job. June 20th, Wednesday. 
Woke two nights past to the crashing of thunder. Now the rain does not stop and we are awash with water. July 9th, Monday. Today at table, my aunt and uncle talk softly mouth to ear. Isbel, my aunt's companion, has told me that a grand earl is coming to Stradenboro. He and his household are journeying north and will rest at the castle for at least two nights. I divine from their talk that my aunt and uncle are already planning a great banquet for the visit, even though tis still some weeks away. July 14th, Saturday. This morn, my aunt told Isabel the reason for my uncle's keen preparations, and as she is friendly towards me, Isabel has entrusted me also with the secret. It seems this great earl has the ear of the king, and my uncle hopes to gain favor by welcoming him. Though my uncle's castle is grand, this earl has an estate many times larger, and there are pebbles on a beach, so he has gold coins in equal numbers. July 20th, Friday. Isabel tutored me in table manners this day, though I needed it not. If you eat with the Earl's household while they are here, she said, have the care to spit politely on the floor, not over the table. When I sniffed, she reminded me that I should wipe my nose. It is only seemly to clean my hand on my clothes before touching food. Yeah. July 27th, Friday. Towards the end of lessons today, we heard music from beyond the castle walls. Abigail and I made haste to find out whence had come this sound, and Simon told us that a band of players had passed by on their way to the village inn. They have come at my uncle's bidding for the banquet. These folk journey near and far, singing from their bread, and Simon has said he will take us to see them on the morrow. July 28th, Saturday. We found the players outside the village church, amusing a crowd of folk. The tumblers were most marvelous, and though one showed me how he walks on his hands, I could not master even one step. The minstrel sang of our king's victory in the West. Their verses brought news, too, of wars and great happenings in other lands. Most songs were jolly, though, and the crowd that had gathered there knew them of old and joined in with the choruses. A few folk dropped a farthing in a leathern hat, which the tumblers passed around. Others gave them bread or cheese, or brought a jug of ale to pay for this fine entertainment. July 30th, Monday. Two great ox carts trundled across the drawbridge to the kitchen yard. It took cook servants near half the day to unload and store all the provisions for the feast. The first cart bore barrels of wine and ale so large they had to be rolled for they could not be lifted. The second cart held all manner of meats and fish. One was most strange, with the tail of a fish, but the fur of a beast, and the face of a man with whiskers complete. Later, Cook told me twas some kind of beast. Tis fantastical food we shall be eating when at least we sit down at our trenchers. On Wednesday arrives the Earl, and on Thursday will be the banquet. August 7th, Tuesday. These five days passed the whole household suit in hall in honor of our most noble guest, the Earl of Branstone. But straight away after the feast, a fever afflicted me, and I was taken to lie in the great chamber, where my aunt Isabel could watch over me. Though somewhat recovered, I am as weak as a kitten and must stay in bed, so shall I use the time to write of past events, for I fear I neglect my journal. The feast itself was the grandest thing I have ever seen. I could not help but stare at the many fine clothes and the gold and silver dishes. It was the food, though, that caused all present to gasp in amazement and marvel at the seemingly endless array of dishes. Here were majestic peacocks, stuffed and roasted and proudly dressed in their feathers, and there the tiny tons of larks and fish of all kinds in plenty, baked and boiled and platter after platter of roasted meats rich with sauces. And here's an image of this feast. You have people in the middle here that are entertaining them with dances. And then around here are the tables where people are eating their dinners. The Earl had come with a host of servants who helped us bring out the dishes for each course. Each dish was carried in with much ceremony and presented to my uncle and the Earl before it was served. When the dishes were laid on the tables, we sat down to eat. There were a great many dishes I did not recognize. One seemed half bird, half beast. Mark named it cockatrice, tis called but I know not where it is hunted. This made Humphrey laugh so hard that he almost spit out his food. Mark, he snorted, tis but a kitchen trick. First they pluck a big fowl and cut it across the waist. Then they take a piglet, likewise cut in half, and so talk of one 
to bottom of the other. This cockatrice tasted good, but the noble earl would not eat of it or of any other dish before his butler had tasted it to see if it was fit for his master. I tire now, and so shall write more upon the morrow.